Okay, so the last session, uh, today we're going to have a guest lecture by uh, Kavita, uh, Kavita Selvaraj. So I've known Kavita for uh, several years and by way of introduction, uh, Kavita is, uh, is an architect and an urban planner and is very interested therefore in urban spaces and urban architecture and a lot of projects that come under that ambit, right? And so she's done a lot of um, pedestrianization related projects, uh, projects essentially which try to, um, uh, how shall I say this, probably increase sort of citizen involvement in, uh, in, in urban spaces, right? And some of them have taken off well, some of them have had difficulties and challenges and these difficulties and challenges are very similar to the ones that we've seen in metro rail projects or in roads, power plants, etc. So I've asked her to come and talk a little bit about projects that she's worked on, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of that. So she'll sort of take us through some of the things that she's worked on and we can hopefully relate back to the things we've talked about in this class on how to manage infrastructure projects and see what we can reconcile or learn from what Kavita says. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Ashwin, for inviting me to speak at your class. This is uh, maybe third or fourth year that I'm doing this. Happy to be here. Um, what uh, I'd like to talk about is, as Ashwin said, my professional background, my, my day job is an architect. I work on various projects. Many of them are uh, large projects, uh, which in itself might be interesting. But since they are often single client projects, it doesn't have the complexity of a project that's in public space, which area-wise may be much smaller, value-wise definitely smaller. But in terms of challenges, in terms of impact, uh, it's much bigger. So I run two practices. Uh, we do architecture, IT buildings, housing projects, etc. But through CityWorks, which is a small studio that focuses only on public space projects, we try to see what can we do beyond buildings that can make our uh, living in the city a better experience. And, um, and that's, that's kind of uh, a very personal area of interest uh, for me. So in public space design, of course, uh, I think all of you may have in the course of this uh, uh, class itself covered that there are many, many challenges that we face. A lot of it has to do with the way in which governance runs, uh, the way in which our, uh, our country is set up from an institutional point of view. And also, in no small amount, because of the way we as citizens uh, behave in the public domain. So often, people will tell you the same set of people go to Singapore and they behave very differently and look, this is what they do here. So I'm very interested in uh, these kind of issues that uh, look closely at why we are the way we are, given, given climate change, given urbanization, given the quality of our lives, the role that cities play on our health. It's so important that we live in a good urban environment. It's just so important for our future. It's so important for the planet. There's not enough people thinking and working closely in that space. So this is the reason why we're looking at these closely. And um, I'll walk you through three uh, cases today. Uh, through CityWorks, we're looking at streets, parks, playgrounds, lakes, ponds, uh, urban horticulture, a lot on solid waste management, community centers, government schools, primary health centers, etc. These are the kind of projects we're interested in. Today, I will look at uh, two, three uh, cases, and then perhaps we can have a short discussion at the end of it. So you can try and figure out what has worked, what has not worked. And this is a kind of our personal journey as we try and implement some of these projects. Uh, I'm going to look at the Heritage Walkway in Last Church Road, a play a park in Santhome. And the third one is a project that I've done. But I made this for another class, which was an urban design class. So I'm not going to talk about the uh, temple restoration project, even though it's very, very interesting. But I want to talk to you about a new project we're going to start on. That's on another street called Kalvivaru Street. So that, that's a separate presentation. So I'll uh, talk to you about that. Uh, the first project is uh, set in Mailapur. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Mailapur. It's an old part of the city. And uh, it has a lot of history and a lot of culture. And one of the ideas that uh, my home and office is both in Mailapur, and I think as is Ashwin is close enough uh, to that. One of our uh, 
ideas was what could we do to celebrate the history of Mylapur uh, through its public space. And uh, we had an opportunity in terms of uh, a street. This is a uh, Lust Church Road. Oh, I can point out here, right? Yeah. 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 That's Last Church Road. Last Church Road um, is quite wide and uh, it's just outside the heritage precinct. This is where the Kapalishwara temple is and the, and the tank is. And um, it offered an opportunity to actually connect several important historic buildings. Uh, the Last Church being one, the Kapalishwara temple up to Santom church, there is a very vibrant commercial area in and around this place and also some interesting uh, places which are part of India's freedom struggle. There are other buildings that there that you know meetings happened, there is lots of stories to tell about this area because it is a very old part of the city. And uh, the specific physical opportunity there is in that Lust Church Road for whatever reason is very wide and the roads leading in and out of it are not as wide. So it gives an opportunity to actually use that extra space to make a public space that is more pedestrian oriented, not so much uh, dominated by vehicles. And uh, this is what you are seeing in this graphic. It says the roads leading into Last Church Road are only 12 meters, but the street that itself is 24 meters wide. And uh, we saw this as an opportunity to create a central promenade, you know, that can have some uh, interesting panels that talk about the history of Mylapur. So, as someone is walking through that space, they can actually see that. And uh, what you are seeing, the next few sets of pictures, I think maybe, is it okay to switch off this light, if those pictures will be clearer or, or if, if it is clear enough as it is, we can even leave it. Just, just only maybe that one. So, what you see is actually a, a condition that is very typical on many uh, streets in India. It is just that this street section has not been designed. No one has actively thought about, okay, this is the footpath, this is where the services are, this is where the uh, trees are, this is the street light, dustbin, uh, parking area, the lane marking. That is just not been done. So, it is just all of this. Uh, general you know space that you can see on the left side right this is how many of these spaces are and um, this is a corner that just turns so straight in front of us is last church road and as you turn this corner in my office is right there look at the amount of space that's there from this compound wall to this and you know just by studying the texture on the road you can make out where vehicles go and what is just residual urban space so, we found this as a great opportunity and just remember this image because I am going to come back and uh, talk to you about some of the things that we have done here. So, we use, we saw these as opportunities to really do something about. And uh, the entire proposal was about re or not redoing the section, but planning the section because no one had actually planned it before and creating a central promenade with carriageways on both sides and then a walkway which had all the utilities and a place for people to walk and then of course, you had the building and the property line. And uh, we had some illustrations that talked about, I think but that's okay. So, this is the central walkway uh, that is there in the middle which is how we imagine that space could be. Now, as the project uh, took shape, we were actually able to do some amount of transformation just in terms of doing the footpath. I am just actually going to exit out of this presentation, uh, sorry. So, yeah, just to show you that that is the kind of residual spaces on the edge that we were able to utilize. So, this was the design proposal with the central median and the carriageways on both sides and uh, we had thought about the project uh, carefully such that we do the carriageway, we leave the carriageway untouched and look at only the footpaths first. Now, what actually happened eventually is that uh, we managed to get the two sides built and we had intentionally planned it this way because whenever the public in India sees that they are doing something in the middle of the road, 
they think that you're going to affect the traffic flow in some way and then they're going to protest and that's exactly what happened so for fortunately at least we got the two sides done and uh, there was some amount of uh, protest at the uh, middle of the project so this kind of broadly uh, talks about the timeline in terms of uh, contract value it was not very large i think it was 6 crores was the overall project contract it was uh, it was uh, promoted as a footpath project the way in which this project started was that we initiated the project so the consultant as in myself and a few others actually suggested this to the government at that time we had a very very good commissioner vikram kapoor was the commissioner he loved the idea we ran it by the mayor he thought it was a great idea we said we'll have a public consultation and we'll talk to the citizens to see what it is that they feel about it so we had a kind of a town hall meeting so it was in a in a hall in the corporation office and the only people that showed up there because everyone was given one day's notice was uh, people uh, who were hawkers and vendors who were little concerned that perhaps they might be evicted as a result of this project and so the local media covered it they said look there's a heritage walkway project and then some people said okay no one's being evicted so it was fine so the project kind of went through and got into construction so this is the timeline up to this point there was a media report that kind of explained the design some uh, suggestions were incorporated it went into tender as you can see that this process took one year uh, it went into bid there were not enough bidders and it was rebid and all kinds of things like that but finally in 2015 april we started the project and uh, it was going fine till the central median was uh, in construction wherein there was a protest from the public and people said why do we need such a wide footpath right in the middle of the road and at that time uh, we tried to explain that look the roads that lead into this are only two lane the roads that lead out of this are only two lanes why do you need something that's got six lanes right in the middle it makes no sense it's not going to help your traffic flow in any case and if you don't use it properly it's just going to uh, be extra carriage space with all this you know underutilized space and um, to this there was actually uh, no valid response except that people started using um, uh, tactics to attack the project because there are easy ways in the Indian system to derail a project if you don't like it you can always say anything so for example people said look you're doing this because you, this is a one-way street and you don't want us to make it a two-way street and this is benefiting some school that's around the corner I mean things that in a one-on-one -on -one argument we could have actually handled but the way in which the public opposes projects is very difficult to actually step up and who will you explain to and how will you explain it it's, it has its own challenges so um, you can just see these are just some pictures of the project in the process we are trying to get it kind of built on the ground and uh, what I must mention here is that the smallest of things requires very very careful handling in projects like this so every 50 meters it was not something that you could sit in the office and make a drawing and then send it out and then the contractor is going to build it these projects are not done like that every 50 meters there will be somebody's entrance somebody's gate some electrical box some transformer someone uh, always parks their car on that bed there is a fruit seller there was a book seller who had been there for generations that everybody knew including all the you know the ML MLAs and MPs and he had a lot of political support so there's an idli shop guy who you know if you removed his shop he would come the next day and you get a phone call from some minister saying you know you can't do anything about this so every 50 meters of a 400 meter project had so many uh, challenges and what uh, we looked at is uh, really handling it as sensitively as possible for the two sides so taking care of it so I've just actually this uh, we had done a little paper on this uh, with your professor and, and another uh, a professor a junk professor here we'd written a little case study about how it had to be done in such a sensitive manner so like the coconut seller you had to convince him by saying that look we'll put nice benches people can come and have the coconuts but also you know sit there and enjoy rather than you know sitting in the sun so we had all these bollards and convinced him to move it to one side you can just see this is the same space this is what it looked like before 
And after the footpath, he just took over the whole space and was still uh, using it as such, till we said that, look, shift it to one side so people can at least uh, walk by over there. And un unfortunately, in the cyclone, the tree fell. But now he's planted another tree, and it's growing great. So um, another case just further down the street was a, you know, a restaurant that kind of blocked the street with a sign. And then, so this is all, this is not their personal space. This is all the public space. And still, if you want to get something done, you need that sensitivity to handle the situation, right? So he had to be coerced to remove the sign and say, look, we will, you know, revoke your license to run a restaurant here if you don't remove the sign, which is anyway not in his space. So he eventually did it. So then that footpath looks nicer now. And this is how they were parking in that space before. There were some areas where we actually got it removed, and then the shop was there two days later. And now it's there. It's got its little thatch hut, etc. So there were some areas which were very challenging, and some areas we were able to actually make it work. But the key to this story is really not so much uh, the sites, which with some difficulty for the most part we managed to get done. But the key challenge was the central median, which was the crux of the project. So we got it implemented to this level. So if you see in February of uh, 2016, it was aligned. The curbs were done. Traffic was moving fine. There was no problem. The two sides were done. There was absolutely, we let it be like this for a few weeks. So there was absolutely no problem with the traffic. But still, there was a group that actually came up and said that, look, this is a really dumb idea to have a, such a large walkway right in the middle of the road. And nobody actually consulted us. And we said, look, we had a public consultation. They said, no, no, we were not there in that consultation. So we think this is a very bad idea. And so you had this project, which had reached this stage, they actually got it dismantled. And the other th important thing to note is this was just a few months before the elections. So at that point, there was no one to actually step up and speak on behalf and say that, look, there's nothing wrong with this project. This was all signed off. And it's not, there are no negative fallouts of this. And people just said, no, no one wanted to take a chance. So g you can see from the timing that between March to May, elections were in May, it was dropped. So it's uh, covered in the local media, saying that you know the promenade is dropped. And respite for locals, as if it was very difficult for them to have a wide footpath in the middle of the road. So some of the reasons why, uh, in hindsight, we think that it failed is that there was really no champion for the project. And, that, and the project didn't originate from the neighborhood or from the residence itself. And uh, where we were involved with people, it was a more a technical approach from our team itself. And uh, that's why some of it got done, and then a lot of it uh, did not get done. So since then, we did a few things. Uh, we did uh, an event around that corner that uh, looked at. We created a map. Uh, this map is in the same corner. You can see the vegetable, the, the, the Yernir guy, tender coconut guy is in that corner over there. We put up a big map that talked about all the historic buildings in Mylapore and essentially uh, said people can use this as a starting point of a heritage walk. We did a small event around traditional games in that area and said people can use this space as a community space. I have to say that while this event was a success, people haven't done other events like this after that, unfortunately. But it's actively used by the people who come there to have the tender coconut. So at least someone's benefiting uh, from that uh, open space. Uh, as a continuation of that project, we did one more uh, sort of uh, community engagement project where we looked at a wall. This is very close to the same place. It's all on Lust Church Road. So this wall is very much on Lust Church Road. And we said, look, here's a wall which used to have all these posters. Would it not be interesting if we could bring people together to give them a sense of uh, ownership over the street? And we hired an artist to actually make an artwork uh, on the wall. And we called it Art for Change. And uh, we, everyone, the, the MLA came, the local police came, Ashwin was there, uh, we were there, my kids were there. So there lots of people who came together to actually paint this wall. And it became a very nice, well-spent Sunday morning where we came together and actually created this very, very nice uh, wall art. 
And what was nice about this is about 300 people participated in putting this together. And this wall remains almost exactly like this even today. This is more than a year, more than a year since we uh, did this project. So our approach also changed in terms of bringing change in creating a sense of ownership and seeing what can people do to feel that they are a part of this. Uh, I want to talk about two other projects that happened after this only to share uh, our experiences in trying to get work like this done. Oh, I have to search this PC. There's two other projects I want to talk about. I'll speak very, very briefly about this. So we'll have about 10, 15 minutes uh, for a discussion. This is a, uh, this is a park that we are doing in Santom. It's, uh, sp it's called an inclusive play space and it's specifically designed for children with disabilities to have a place that they can also uh, be at and play with children who don't have disabilities. And this project was initiated by this group called the Disability Rights Alliance, where they are focusing on how can we make our cities inclusive. So what they do is they petition, say, Metro Rail is uh, building the project. They will make sure or they will try to get hold of the plans to see if it is wheelchair accessible, if the standards are being met, if the Braille signage is there, if it's comfortable for the visually impaired, things like that. So this is a loose group. There is no official organization as such. But they approached us because they know that we are interested in creating uh, positive public spaces and said, can you, can you help us to create this park? And uh, with this group, we uh, brainstormed. We had uh, partners. We had another partner called Kilikili who was very interested to see how uh, children learn through play, and uh, especially autistic children, and how they can be engaged with others. Because they, you know, people with a spectrum disorder uh, come with a lot of social anxiety issues and sometimes a nice environment brings out positive experiences uh, for them in the public. So the opportunity that we had is that we had a lot of expertise. We had people who are working with children with disabilities. We had uh, official and government support because uh, this was in a defined space. It did not affect anyone in that sense. And uh, right adjacent to the site that we finally did this project in, which was in Santom, there was a state resource center which is meant for teachers to come and learn how to deal with children with disabilities. So this was the uh, background. And what we uh, did is we, this project started in February of 2017 as an idea. And we are going to open next month. So it has taken a long time. But the challenges in this project have been lesser for, very re for various reasons. One is that we didn't come up with the project. The project is initiated by uh, people who are also an alliance in themselves. And it's a very strong cause. There is a lot of uh, goodwill around creating such a kind of a space. And uh, there is, I don't think there's any such park anywhere in Chennai at least uh, now. So there is a interest in being the first of a kind. Uh, that was one reason. Second is, this was a, a playground. And we did have protests from people who were using the playground before, in the sense that they said, look, we play, we've been playing in this playground for many years. And now you're you know, using it for something else. And then we had to go and make a presentation to say that it's still a playground. You can still play. But of course, we want to do all these other things for the children. So the case for actually protesting was little less because the cause was what it was. And the beneficiaries were children with disabilities. So the, the resistance, even for such a project, was there, just to make that point. And the third is the smart city took this under their wing, and it became a smart city project. I mean, literally, smart city had nothing to do with it, except that we came up with the project, created a design, made a presentation, got an in-principle approval. And then the smart city team, which was kind of just forming at that time, said, look, this will come under the smart city budget, because these are the kind of projects that uh, we are supporting. So we used that opportunity and actually built it out uh, under that. So uh, it actually uh, came under smart city last year in October, went to tender, and 
the construction started around May. And in six months, we've actually been able to uh, put most of it together. The concept itself uh, is quite uh, simple and straightforward. It's essentially 15,000 square feet of space. So it's about a uh, little less than an acre. No, it's only half an acre. And what it does is it actually uh, makes a loop so people can go for a walk around. But there's also different kinds of uh, play equipment in that space. And uh, what we've tried to do is create something for everyone. So that's, the, that's why it's called an inclusive park. So here are some pictures. I mean, this, these are some views which we had prepared initially to kind of sell the idea. Uh, one of the lessons we learned in the previous uh, Last Church Road project was that the imaging and the vision was not communicated graphically, was not communicated visually to a lot of people. It was just a tender document, and there were drawings, and there were not 3D views that actually told people this is what's going to look like and this is how it's going to be. So this time we made a point from the first uh, meeting itself to have 3D drawings that showed people what that space looked like. And we made elaborate explanations about the benefit of the project. So this presentation that you're seeing is a modification of what we had made to show to the DC works of that time that why is this, uh, see, this whole presentation, what you're seeing, was to explain to him what is a park? What is a, a park with a disability? What does that mean? And it was like a checklist, you know, you need to have, you know, barrier-free toilets, you need to have, everything should be accessible by wheelchair, they need to be tactile signage, it should be comfortable for visit. So literally, we made a presentation to tell what is this concept, and then, uh, did a lot of communication to share that idea with them. So that was a lesson that was learned from the previous project. Uh, the other uh, thing was we had to, once we made this slide and we explained to them that this is for children with sensory processing issues. They're basically uh, on the spectrum, uh, autism, children with autism, children who cannot uh, move freely. So either they have crutches or they have, or they're on wheelchair, uh, or children who are visually challenged. And for each of these children, there are small playthings that to you and me would just look like it's nothing specific, but for a child to be able to balance on a curb itself is challenging. So there are uh, specific things that we have done. And how we did it is we actually involved the teachers and the parents of the children who come to the State Resource Center for treatment. So we actually, at the start of the project, had a workshop with them. And uh, that has been very helpful because it is, one, it has helped the design. Secondly, it has made it almost difficult for anyone to come up and say that there's something wrong with it. Because at every step of the way, we call the people from the Disability Rights Alliance and say, come look at this. Tell us if we've made anything wrong. Tell us if there's something that we can do. Not always it's possible to take the suggestions, but the sense that they are part of the process was something that we learned from our past project. and then. We felt it's really important that uh, these are the people who are the activists. This is the group that goes to places, audits, and says this is all what is wrong with it. So it makes sense to carry them along through the process. And of course, we were lucky that there is a, the government selected a good contractor, and he was also committed to working on this project. And more than anything else in this project, we became the owners. So we raised funds for this project for all the equipment that could not be done through the tendering process. Now, this is above and beyond the scope of a normal consultant. There's no consultant who would do this. We fundraised and made presentations to corporates, to private citizens to say, look, we are doing a very interesting project. Can you, you know, help us with buying? We bought a singing stone. We bought uh, musical chimes. We bought... Uh, some special signage, which through the tender process is not possible to procure. Now, this makes it very difficult to replicate. It's not, it's not easy for someone to create 10 other parks like this, because in each park, then you need a champion to drive it. And uh, or maybe I'm wrong, and maybe we can make a book about this, and then people will figure out how to make more of these. So. So you can actually see that a lot of things that we have done, and this is going to open next month, so you can actually go have a look. And we'll see what the feedback is uh, after it's open. 
The challenge I imagine for this park is that while in implementation we've been able to surmount the difficulties, the challenge is going to come in maintenance because where do we have enough of infrastructure like this that it will just get overwhelmed by the number of people who come and people's attitude towards public space and attitude towards public property that we, we are not sure if it's going to withstand that kind of uh, usage. And uh, perhaps next year's batch will hear the story of what happened to this park uh, after it gets inaugurated. But uh, we've managed to even find uh, a company to take care of the maintenance. And this is uh, where you see the role uh, of a person who owns the project and you're able to kind of carry it from end to end, sort of pre-concept to post uh, maintenance. So that's where uh, we are hopefully uh, this will work. But again, like I said, in maintenance, we'll have to see what challenges we face then. So these are just some features of the park. It's, uh, you know, even a, some small, something like a table is designed such that a wheelchair can access, swing is modified, merry-go-round is uh, modified, there is an inclusive sand pit where you can see that a child in a wheelchair can come and then play with some child who is sitting on that platform. So these are a lot of small, small uh, design details. And we've got an artist who's going to be uh, doing an interactive wall where we're going to have wheels and pipes and tubes that you, know, you can touch and feel. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, tactile marking, things like that. There is a herb garden. So there's a lot of excitement about the opening. And uh, we will see if this works out nicely. Oh, one important thing I wanted to tell is, so one of the things that, so there's a big wall that's going to come up. This is in progress. I mean, today the artist is there. He was working on this to finish it. One of the things we did is we bought these tiles and uh, we cut them into smaller pieces and sent them to many different schools which, have, which work with children with disabilities. So each of those children have painted on the tile. We've collected all those tiles back. And we're going to do this big wall. So you can see this is in my office. All the tiles are there. And it's super exciting to see this. This is all going to go into one big mural. So what it does is then, you, what we want to do is, we want people who come there, we want the residents of that area to feel that, look at the time and the effort, the energy that has gone into creating this. And let us see what we can do to keep it from getting spoiled. And to build that sense of ownership is not easy. And unless that sense of ownership is there, I don't think we can actually transform our cities. It's not possible for government officials, and it's not possible to police uh, these things. We are 10 million people. How many cops, how many government officials is going to take to monitor? It has to be definitely led by citizens. So um, this is our park project. And the last project I will talk to you about before we go to a discussion is a, a project that's going to start. What am I doing here? This is uh, something that we've been thinking about. Ashwin, you haven't seen, you haven't seen this project. We, uh, this is right behind Vidya Mandir School. Uh, it's along the Buckingham Canal. And for the last four years, I've been trying to see if we can do something uh, for this street. It's a very small street. Uh, it's not on the main road. It's not on the bus road. It's just a little street that goes along Buckingham Canal. And uh, it's a disaster. I mean, if you actually see the place, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's symptomatic of perhaps every, all along Buckingham Canal, this is what it looks like. And uh, in the initial years, we tried to uh, sell it as a footpath project, as an uh, urban environment project, as a way of uh, tackling the mosquitoes uh, menace, like a health hazard. Somehow nothing uh, worked. M most recently, that is as recently as few weeks ago, we made this presentation to a few people. This included the MLA, the uh, Southern Railway, PWD, Chennai Corporation, and a couple of 
donors, we are, we are thinking that they are going to be donors in the future, potential donors. And we have identified a person who can be the champion and anchor this project. So at the start of the project itself, we have tried to bring who all we think may be involved in this for a discussion under one roof. Now, one way of handling this has been to sell it as a mobility project. What this street does is it connects to MRTS stations, Tirumailai and Mundakanyaman Koil Street. And uh, there is a clear mandate to make, uh, that is part of Chennai Corporation's policy as also at a nationwide level, we are looking at how to increase accessibility to public transport. And you know, everyone knows that we can't build our city's infrastructure on private modes of transport. That's just not going to be sustainable in India. So uh, we try to see, sell it as that idea that how can we increase the access to public transportation by cleaning up the street and making it uh, accessible. Uh, so this street, Kalvivaru street, so this is Kapalishwara temple. I talked to you about Lust Church Road, which is here. Um, and what this street, this is Royapata High Road. So if you go this way, it goes to Adyar. I don't know how familiar you are with this area. I am pretty sure none of you would have ever gone to this street because it is not, it's not a main road at all. It's somewhere along the Buckingham Canal. You kind of can get a glimpse of it as you're going on Kacheri Road if for any reason any of you have had to go there. But uh, where it has some possible advantages that there's a lot of traffic on this RK Mutt Road and Royapata High Road. This is an important link. Interestingly, this is an alignment of a future metro line. The future metro is going to come through this. I don't know when, but this is recently I came to know that the metro is going to run through this. The traffic on this road is enormous. So we are saying that by those who want to come here and turn left to, to Kacheri, Kacheri Road can actually do this and go uh, on Kacheri Road so that it uh, minimizes the impact of movement on that, that road. So there is an advantage from the traffic point of view. Now one of the things that we have learnt is to sell the project through multiple lenses because different things appeal to different people. So when you are in public domain, not every advantage is going to appeal to you. So you can sell it from the traffic angle, you can sell it from the health angle, you can sell it from, look, it's going to be easier for you to drop your kids off at school because you're going to have a you know, safe place for them to get on and a footpath for them to walk. There is a mosque in the, on that street where it is very crowded on Fridays, so there's going to be designated parking space for them. So how you actually position something and how you build a narrative around something that seems to appeal to a wide set of people is something that we are realizing is very, very important. And uh, unless you carry along all your, as many, of course there will still be some four people who will come and say this is a disaster and I am going to talk about where the challenges uh, with regard to that are. Um, it, it helps to start the project with this big list of advantages for different, different types of stakeholders. And um, the big problems by not designing public space, and this is a perfect example of that, is in the middle of the night, people come and dump construction debris over there. And in infrastructure projects, uh, if, if this is what your class is looking at, during the process of construction, there's so much of uh, concrete and jelly and all kinds of waste material that gets generated by demolition. We don't have an enforcing mechanism that people are uh, following. So quietly they'll come in the middle of the night and look to see which part of the city is underutilized where no one's looking, where there's not enough lights and just dump the stuff over there. And that's what's happening here. So you can see there's a illegal dumping of construction debris, there's rampant encroachment, there are uh, there are a couple of guys who are running full-fledged mechanic shops over there on the street. So it's basically like free real estate. So if someone were to ask, why are our public spaces the way they are, you would actually see there's a huge thriving economy there. It's like free land. So this project is uh, going to face a lot of challenges going forward and we'll have to figure out how to handle it. But 
the crux of the matter is a lot of smaller streets in our country are entirely devoted to a lot of economy and we are not able to monetize that and we are not able to generate enough funds to actually run our projects or to create you know proper infrastructure for anything else so i mean that's a that's a, that's a bigger issue anyway so what we are uh, doing is we've made a drawing so we've done a measured drawing we've created a a plan that has a walkway it has a there's a space for driving the space for parking there is uh, some amenities that are for uh, the people on the other side of the buckingham canal which are squatters where they are actually kind of built on the side of the canal itself so there's lots of illegal settlements there and um, here the challenge we face is that difference of the so different social classes when they come together in one space you will talk to one they want something else and then you talk to the legal residents in the apartment buildings they're like we said we'll build a public toilet here as well it will be helpful they said no no don't build a toilet who's going to maintain it how is it going to run then we said we'll do an outdoor gym at least people can from there can come and use it they said no 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 we don't want those people and all coming to this site i mean this is public space so just in order to come up with something that many people agree on it's very very difficult it's very challenging so uh, again we have some common elements that we are now putting into the design itself where we feel that these are opportunities where people can come out and participate and be part of the process uh, so there is a walkway we are still going ahead with the outdoor gym there is some resistance from the middle class families to create any facilities that brings people from the lower class families from the other side of the canal to this side but uh, as of now the design it remains and here's the big challenge uh, and of course we for those of you who know this area you will it's a very very badly designed road where the mrts alignment is ridiculous it just goes on the canal and then suddenly cuts across and goes and creates a blind spot there's a big wall here that actually if someone's driving here they cannot see that side so we are suggesting demolishing this wall and doing some landscaping i mean i don't want to get into the specifics of the design but just from a safety point of view there's a lot of advantages there where we see challenges in this project is that in that small stretch this whole stretch is only 350 meters in that small stretch the pwd owns the canal has has jurisdiction over the canal the southern railway has jurisdiction over the mrts line and therefore the pylons and the land that comes below this because they have jurisdiction over uh, the safety of the pillars and the chennai corporation has jurisdiction of the rest of the space so literally in that little strip that i showed you there's already three major government departments that come into play and this is the reason why for the last 4 years when i've been trying to do something around this it has actually not worked at all till we figured out that we need to bring all of these people under under one roof and then have a person to actually follow up with each of these departments because they will not talk to each other there's no mechanism by which we can uh, force one to talk to the other and these are all just the institutional challenges uh, that we face i also talked briefly already about the uh, different social classes that uh, have access that this is the front or back for people and there is a difference of opinion on if we clean up the place what it should be the tragedy is that right now it's used for dumping it's used for illegal activities it is used uh, as a mechanic shop and it's it's so pathetic right now but still when you want to make a proposal over what it could be the view of what it should be is very different depending on who you talk to so that's one challenge in terms of and as it starts to take shape we will we will find that people will come up and oppose for various reasons because of this uh, the third is this is such a secondary street it's really hardly in the it's not going to impact the rest of chennai so who should pay for it and why so when you have the financial constraints of a state or a city the way it is why should any money be spent on some secondary street like this and like this there may be you know 100000 such uh, places and lastly the constraint is on who owns it who drives it and how does it get put in place 
So, for the financial constraint, we have a strategy. I mean, for each of these, we have strategies. Uh, that's all our learnings, hopefully, we should be able to overcome them. We are selling this as a footpath project to Chennai Corporation and say that, look, you build this footpath, it gives access to this MRTS and nothing else. So, you just do a footpath. We will raise funds for all the other elements. Uh, you do the road, you do the footpath, that's enough. Now, we would probably be able to raise funds for the whole project as of now, because that's the kind of goodwill that is generated around this. But we don't want to do that, because if you start to raise funds to build a road, you will actually really annoy those people who are road contractors, who are the vendors who actually work on these projects. So, we are careful not to mess with the system so much that it becomes, it becomes a change, right? So, there's still the road and the footpath on the right side is going to be sold as a footpath project. The part on the left that comes under the MRTS along the canal will become a beautification project for which we will fundraise and figure out some donors who will be able to give all the extras. And in terms of ownership, thanks to technology, now we have a WhatsApp group and uh, we are doing a whole study on how WhatsApp is impacting a lot of the work that we are doing in and around this area is really possible only because of WhatsApp, really. And so we have a WhatsApp group. It has the MLA right now. It has this guy who is a coordinator for this project. We are going to push this project through the Mailapur Welfare, Mailapur Residence Welfare Association. So it's going to appear as if this is driven by the resident association. And there's a lot of traction that they have around health and how, you know, mosquito breeding, illegal dumping is going to get stopped. So, they're going to push for that angle. So, we're trying to create a structure that will make it possible for it to be uh, talked of and uh, sort of overcome that. And uh, I already talked about this, the multiple institutional ownerships. And this is some pictures to just show you what this area looks like. There's actually a guy who lives here. Uh, they managed to evict a whole bunch, but then one or two houses they were not able to evict. This is the uh, canal on the other side. Uh, this is what it looks like. There's continuous dumping. Just look at this. This is what it looks like right now. So, we are looking at the, uh, this is on the Kalviwaru street side. This Vidya Mandir school is to our left. This is Buckingham Canal and these are the illegal squatter settlements on the other side. This is kids coming out of the school at 3 o'clock in the evening. It's absolute and utter chaos. Uh, there are vendors that are just sitting over there. Uh, this is a picture of that turning that I was uh, talking about. I showed in the drawing that there's a turning that's very unsafe. This street leads up to Kacheri Road and initially there was a big wall over there. We managed to get railways to actually break the wall and then they got very worried when the wall was broken and they said, look, people are going to damage our pylons. So, they went ahead and built this grill, which is better from a safety point of view, but still it's not as per our design. So, we have to now figure out how to convince them to uh, even remove this grill, which I think is possible. We're going to have a sculpture garden below this. So, at some point, uh, this is going to work. This is a uh, a meeting that we had last week and this is the Mailapur MLA with all the different departments that I was talking about, they were there. So, this is, these are the three uh, stories I wanted to share and perhaps um, if you want to have a structured or non-structured discussion, I don't know how you want to take this. I'm happy to take any questions, but if you want to have a discussion around this, I'm… Yeah, we can take a few questions and then yeah. I might have a question for the class. So. One thing is that… Um, there are some people who work in public space in Chennai who by association have some credibility. So, I am luckily one of those people. So, that is an unfair or fair advantage, I do not know. But if we go to the government and say, look, we think this is a good idea, they will listen to it. At least they will allow us to enter the office and make a presentation for this. Whether it works or not, we do not know. Second is, if it is not very complicated and it does not in involve evicting so and so and, you know, it is not 
filled with that many challenges that they know they can see a project and they can know that this is ever going to happen or not going to happen they know that already right some areas are very complicated so they will look at that definitely uh, the third is uh, usually these projects there are two parts one when you say government there are two parts of the government right there's a bureaucracy and there's the political side so in some projects we've had the support of both still projects have failed which is like the last church road projects both the mayor and the commissioner were they signed off and they were like this is great still the project has failed so when you say it's just the having the government support is not enough at least that's what i have learned and sometimes one supports and the other doesn't support also it works or it may not so in fact that's what is challenging so if they have money it's not too complicated and it's backed by some credible sources there's no reason for them to not consider it it goes through the system there is there is a full fledged system that's in place of course lot of people approach them with lot of projects lot of possibilities and a lot of people don't also because how much time and effort it takes you have to come up with the full design before you even go to them so a lot it's, it's not like there are enough there are that many people who will take the time and effort to do that as well right many projects that you are seeing so for example if you look at the marina beach beautification project that is all come from the government side itself as far as i know i've lived here now for 15 years no oh, more than that 16 17 years and um, they would have beautified the beach like four times you know they spent the money again and again in those same places it's a lack of ideas they actually would welcome people coming and giving them suggestions and ideas they will listen to it whether it moves forward or not depends on how you move it through the system yeah 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 absolutely i mean so like janagraha there uh, there is there are parallel organizations in fact uh, itdp which is doing a lot of very similar work to janagraha in chennai have managed to create a sort of a template or a document that has been adopted by corporation of chennai as the street design guidelines so all that exists in theory in and and some projects have been implemented a lot of what you are seeing right now is implemented through that what they have are doing only now which i think bangalore is little ahead of chennai is that the complete services integration with the street design that is now happening in tnagar as part of the smart city project whereas in bangalore they have successfully managed to do a few more streets like that like church street and mg road and all that has already been done like that tender shore roads the tender shore project yeah so uh, that way they are a little ahead in terms and i think a very strong and well connected ngo like that has played a role but there uh, big corporates have given a strong push and the government side also there has been good support to it so uh, like things have fallen in place here in chennai there have been some challenges but that's exactly what we also try to do but there have been many challenges i think you had a question yeah so actually this road is 80 feet wide so in 80 feet 20 20 feet on both sides for uh, traffic is i mean for more than enough and uh, we had wide footpaths on both sides also so it's not like the footpath in the two corners are not existing they are also existing so there are there are buildings there is a walkway on both sides of the road which is also wide beyond this there is space available so in fact when we made the original presentation we had four schemes in one there was a service road concept in one it was very wide on one side and the two way road was on the other side so like that there were four schemes that were presented of which this one that you're seeing with the wider median in the center was selected and that went through a process so 
we presented four schemes in which the mayor, the commissioner, deputy commissioner, ITDP at that time, Chennai City Connect, all of us were there in the room where we selected, okay, let's go ahead with this scheme. The thought process at that time was that the, uh, the streets on both sides are for everyday access, it's for regularly moving. If someone wanted to stop and sort of uh, read a little bit about what buildings on that side, what buildings on this side, you could actually take that centre path. It's not as if it is only in the footpath and not, only in the centre, not on both sides. It was not like that. It's there on both sides also. In addition, it was there in the centre as a walkway. But your question is valid and this was what a lot of people asked. Why are you putting this in the middle? At one point, I said, I'll give that whole thing up and we'll plant only trees in the middle. I was willing to do that as well. They said, no, no, you're making the road too small. We need that wider road. Uh -huh.